Good morning. Glad you're back with us. If you have your Bibles uh, handy, turn to Acts chapter 10. We're continuing our journey through the book of Acts. I have a question for you this morning, and, and it's really pretty simple. What's it take to convince you of something? Is seeing it on the internet enough? <laughs> Believe it or not, 1985 or so, I connected a computer with a 2400 baud acoustic modem to Southwestern Bell's brand new packet switching network, as they called it. And I browsed the card catalog of the Oklahoma State University Library from my office in Moore, Oklahoma. Sounds pretty exciting, doesn't it? I have to tell you, my first glimpse at a public internet and from that green screen text only environment was was something more than just special i was pretty much hooked i saw something that would revolutionize the way that people would communicate with one another how they would collaborate on projects be able to uh, work together share ideas and solve problems from great distances i mean yeah we had things like teletype and and those kinds of messaging, basic messaging systems, but they were noisy and slow. And uh, I, but I was witnessing the dawning of this communications platform that had great potential. I'd heard of such electronic magic. After all, the internet was almost 10 years old by that point, but it was mind boggling to actually experience it for myself. That single event changed my vocational um, trajectory, so to speak, that day. I've worked with emerging technologies throughout the rest of those years between then and now, and, and it's been quite a journey. I have uh, sought to improve upon the technologies I've worked with. I've implemented them. I've even designed some new ones. I can't tell you how many times I failed. It was a bunch. But sometimes we actually accomplish something really cool. One of the exercises we used in that process was something called proof of concept. You know, when we got this idea of how to improve something or, or change something, make something new. We would, we would attempt to, to show that it could be done with this proof of concept exercise. A lot of really smart people taught me a lot of things along the way, and I'd like to think that I've passed on not only what I learned from them, but some of the personal discoveries I made as well. That practice, proof of concept, was a way to convince people that something could work. But really, because you kind of have to see it. What we find in our text this morning in Acts chapter 10 is, I think, a proof of concept. It was, a, it was an exercise for Peter. It was God's plan and his uh, proof of concept that he was showing him. But the idea is that God wanted Peter to know that all people had the opportunity to be saved. Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy, I urge then, first of all, that petitions, prayer, intercessions, and thanksgivings be made for all people, for kings and all those in authority, that we may live peaceful and quiet lives in all godliness and holiness. This is good and pleases God our Savior, who wants all people to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. See, I know that salvation is offered. I also know that salvation is offered to all people. Peter had to learn that, and he really needed a proof of concept. So read with me, and by the way, the passage is pretty long this morning, but I want us to read together this entire passage because I think it all must be put together. Acts chapter 10, beginning at verse 23. Then Peter invited the men into the house to be his guests. The next day, Peter started out with them and some of the brothers from Joppa went along. The following day, he arrived in Caesarea, and Cornelius was expecting them and had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter entered the house, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet in reverence. But Peter made him get up. Stand up, he said. 
I am only a man myself. Talking with him, Peter went inside and found a large gathering of people. He said to them, You are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or visit him. But God has shown me that I should not carry, should not call any man impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? And Cornelius answered, Four days ago, I was in my house praying at this hour at three in the afternoon. Suddenly, a man in shining clothes stood before me and said, Cornelius, God has heard your prayer and remembered your gifts to the poor. Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He is a guest in the home of Simon the Tanner, who lives by the sea. So I sent for you immediately, and it was good of you to come. Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to say to tell us. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, telling the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached. How God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him that everyone who believes in him will receive forgiveness and of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. And then Peter said, can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the time that you've given us to look into your word today and hear and see this proof that you gave Peter as he approached these Gentiles who became believers. God, I know sometimes that it is in unexpected ways that you act and show yourself. And so God, I pray that you would help us to be as open to new ideas, new ways to reach people with the gospel of your son Jesus, the same way that Peter was open to reach people that he thought should never hear the gospel. God, thank you for showing us the truth. We pray that you will help us to embrace it and live in such a way that we're able to also draw folks to the cross to meet your son, Jesus. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. You know, God's going to stretch us beyond our own understanding in proving the gospel. Peter's being educated, by the way, and his prejudices are being attacked and removed one by one. You have to remember that he was staying in the house of a tanner. And so if we understand that uh, from a Jewish perspective, he was staying with a person who was ceremonially unclean because of his work with dead things. He literally was a tanner of leather. And so he had to take dead animals, skin them, and tan the hides. And so by law, this uh, person that Peter was staying with could not worship 
because of his uncleanliness. The second thing that Peter did was he invited Gentiles into the house. When Cornelius' men showed up at Simon the Tanner's house, he invited them in. Again, against the Jewish law. Traveling to a foreign land to see people for whom Peter did not think the gospel even applied was something that was quite contrary to his belief about how the gospel was to spread. But he arrives at his destination and he still doesn't understand all that he has experienced. And he said to them in verse 28, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or visit him. But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without raising any objection. May I ask why you sent for me? You know, Peter's lesson is to bring him to the understanding for the first time that the gospel is for everyone. No exceptions. But he still needed proof. A follower of Jesus Christ is going to be stretched. If you have accepted Christ as your Savior, there are going to be events in your life that are going to stretch the, the limits of your understanding. There will be things that will happen to you that will try to help you cross the boundaries of life that keep you from sharing the gospel to someone who needs to hear it. Maybe it's prejudice. Maybe it's societal. Maybe it is something else. But there, the reality is that God is going to stretch us as believers. Peter had to leave his comfort zone and go to a place that just changed the way he thought about who the gospel was for. We will too. God will stretch our understanding of sharing the gospel. And there's proof. You know, responding to God's call to leave the comfortable will present new opportunities, but it will also prove the gospel. In verse 34, we read, Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men from every nation who fear him and do what is right. I want to tell you that's some growth. That is personal growth that we see in Peter. He has seen the proof that God is speaking to people outside his little circle. And Cornelius' explanation of why he sent for Peter alone showed Peter that God was speaking to Gentiles who were outside this Jewish circle. And so Peter's circle just got a lot bigger. Cornelius broke the news that God's messenger spoke to him. And I want to tell you that that was big news to Peter. God spoke to a Gentile, gave him directions, and the Gentile responded in a favorable manner and followed the directions. Peter has seen that the gospel has to be presented to everyone, not just to those in Jerusalem, not just to those in the Jewish faith. Everyone. Everyone including Gentiles. After all, even Gentiles got to worship in the courtyard of the Gentiles at the temple. But I want to tell you that God is not done showing Peter some new things, and Peter is about to learn even more. It's kind of like if a group of us went to some fancy church in some other town, and they found out that we were from Darty. And they said, oh, you know, y'all are from Darty, and so you really, you have to stay in the foyer. You can't come into the sanctuary to worship with the rest of us because of where you're from. Now, that would never happen. I mean, that's maybe the silliest thing I've ever said, but the reality is this is the situation that Peter is finding. Those people who were kept at arm's length from even the Jewish faith are now being invited to share in the gospel message of Jesus Christ. In my mind, God proves this, uh, provides a perfect proof of concept to Peter. In fact, I would even call it convincing proof. 
In verse 44, what we read is, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read that, I see convincing proof. Theologians have called this, by the way, the, the Gentile Pentecost, because we have a description of what had happened to the disciples and the apostles there in that room in and we read about in the second chapter of Acts. It's the same experience that they had. It's also the same experience that they, they found, as we read in chapter 8 of Acts, when the Samaritans found the Holy Spirit poured out upon them the way it had been poured out upon the apostles and the disciples in Jerusalem. The bottom feeders, the Gentiles, everyone else in the world, now has this opportunity for the Holy Spirit to be poured out upon them when they receive salvation. I, I think there's a reason why there were so many Jewish witnesses, the circumcised as the text calls it. God wanted this event to provide the convincing proof that the gospel of Jesus Christ is for every living person on this planet, and he wanted those responsible for sharing the gospel to experience that power firsthand. Now it's notable here, I, and I don't, I don't want to take too much away from this, but it is notable. There were no laying on of hands. There was no transmission of the Holy Spirit by the hands of an apostle. The, the, the apostle Peter was not bringing the Holy Spirit. In fact, this happened while Peter was still speaking. God himself poured out the Holy Spirit on these people, these new believers, as they accepted Christ as the Messiah, the Savior of the world. Peter didn't bring the Spirit. God did. If that proof doesn't convince you that salvation is for everyone, I really don't know what else to say but this. I want to echo to you what Cornelius said to Peter when he got there. In the second half of verse 33, we read, Now we are all here in the presence of God to listen to everything the Lord has commanded you to tell us. Well, can I suggest to you that when we gather as a church, or even as you watch this perhaps from your home, we are in the presence of God. And this is what I'm told to say. Jesus Christ is God's son. He came to this planet as a man. He lived a sinless life. At the end of his ministry, as he spent time ministering to people, healing the sick and driving out the evil spirits and the demons that possessed people, he was killed, crucified on a cross. He did that not because he was guilty of some law or guilty of some sin. He did that because we were guilty and we needed a savior. And so he died on that cross to pay the price, the penalty for our sin. He went to a tomb where he stayed for three days. On the third day, God raised him from the dead and he appeared to many witnesses. He lives today, he ascended and he sits at the right hand of the Father and, and he is coming back for his church one day. His church are people who believe what I just said. And because of that belief, they confess their sins and ask God to forgive them of, the, of those sins and to ask Jesus to be Lord of their life. You see, that's the gospel, the good news, and it's for everyone, not just me, 
not just people that darken the doors of a church, everyone. And it's my job to say it. You see, I want you to know, just as Peter learned, I have learned that the gospel is for everyone. It's for you. It's for everyone you know. We have an opportunity to receive that gospel, that good news about Jesus Christ and accept him as our personal Savior and Lord. We have an opportunity to commit our lives to him. And when we do, then we have a gospel story to share ourselves. We become just like Peter. And when we do, God's going to stretch your understanding. He's going to take you places that you might not ever have gone before. And he's going to do that so that you will tell others about the truth of who Jesus is and what he did. Receive it. Share it. And this is the beauty. God will prove it. Not us. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for the truth of your gospel. I thank you for an opportunity to be able to be a messenger who gets to share the truth about your son, Jesus. And God, I don't know who's listening to this message today. Maybe they've heard for the very first time the gospel, the good news about Jesus, and they need to respond to it in a way that proves who you are. Father, give them strength. Help them to recognize the sin that needs to be forgiven and for, to be, help them to confess that sin and accept Christ as Savior and Lord today and then commit their lives to following him. God, for those of us who've done that, maybe not long ago or maybe so long ago it's hard to remember. Father, help us to remember this isn't our story. It's your story. This story isn't just for us. It's for everyone. So God, I pray that you would give us opportunity to share the good news about Jesus so that others can have the Holy Spirit poured out upon them just as you poured out the Holy Spirit on us as we accepted Christ. Father, we love you. We thank you. Help us to be servants. Help us to be those who live for your son, Jesus, every day. For it's in his name we pray. Amen. Thank you for being with me. I, I pray that you got something out of this message. If you're listening to this and you've never accepted Christ as your Savior and you need more information, you need to know what to do. How to reach out to someone you know that you know knows Jesus. I am sure they will help you. You can send me a message on Facebook. You can get hold of me through our YouTube channel. You can come visit us here at Darty Baptist Church. I would love to have a talk with you. I'd love to visit with you and make sure that you understand this good news, this gospel is for you. We'll see you next time. Have a great week.